Um, hi, Michaela, Waldner, Jeff, Art, Andrew. Hello. Keeping the mask on, even though it's virtual. That's a commitment. <laughs> <laughs> Michaela McShane. Brett, everybody's logged in as me. It looks like. Oh, you are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> we, should, we should all be um, so lucky. Yeah. Uh, so hi, I'm, Glenn, a, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to rejoin. I'm going to rejoin on my computer. Hi. Hi, all Glenn. Good. Are you here? You can to, um, rename as you click on the on your screen. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Hold on. Awesome. Awesome. Look at there. Looking good. Okay. Hi. Great. Hi, Malaysia. How are you? I'm good. Hello. Welcome to Denver Startup Week. I'm Tammy Doerr, President and CEO of the Downtown Denver Partnership and co-chair of Denver Startup Week. This year marks the 10-year anniversary of Denver Startup Week. DSW has been the catalyst for lots of change over the past decade. And this week, we're coming together to celebrate the past and dream big for the future. We are able to bring Denver Startup Week to this community thanks to our 2021 sponsors. Thank you to our HQ and title sponsor, Amazon, and our title sponsors whose leadership makes this week come to life. Capital One Cafe, Downtown Denver Partnership, Fluid Truck, Hotel Engine, and WeWork, and our track sponsors who have made all of the great content you're hearing today possible, our founder track sponsor, Kickstart, growth track sponsor, Friday Health Plans, developer track sponsor, Quizlet, product track sponsor, Palantir, our designer track sponsor, Battery 621, and The Public Works, people track sponsor, Exactly, and spotlight event sponsor, Strat Labs. Our headline event sponsors are bringing the excitement to the week. Thank you to B-Side Fund, Colorado Public Radio, Comcast, Coors Brewing, Denver Pavilions, Entrepreneurship at the University of Denver, J.P. Morgan Chase, Method, Moss Adams, Pi Insurance, Promontory Mortgage, Path, Southwest, Tattered Cover, and VF Venture Foundry. Finally, thank you to our partner and member sponsors, all listed on the screen. Please say thank you to these companies as you enjoy our hybrid Denver Startup Week. And don't forget, use the hashtag Den Startup Week to share your experiences and moments of inspiration on social media. Have a great week. Hello everyone, welcome to Denver Startup Week. I'm John, the Spotlight Track Chair and member of the Denver Startup Week Organizing Committee. Before we get started, the Denver Startup Week Organizing Committee acknowledges indigenous people as the original owners of the land on which we reside, which is the traditional territory of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide, ethnic cleansing, stolen land, forced removal, forced, and forced occupation of their territory and we honor those who have stewarded this land throughout generations and all other indigenous tribes and nations who call Colorado home. Thank you for joining us for the 10th anniversary of Denver Startup Week. At Denver Startup Week, we strive to make all of our sessions a space where attendees can connect, learn, and grow, regardless of age, gender identity, gender expression, race, ability, sexual orientation, or the combination of those identities. There is something for everyone at DSW. Thanks to all of our community members who submitted their best content to make this week what it is. And thank you for joining us. Thank you to our sponsors for their support in helping us keep DSW free and accessible for all, especially our Spotlight Track sponsor, Strat Labs. With that, please enjoy this session and the entire week. Great, folks, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, Michaela, are you able to uh, go ahead and share your screen for us? Um, it, it's giving me, it's saying I can't actually. 
Okay. Uh, folks, uh, is there anybody from Denver Startup Week on the line that could help us with um, sharing, please? Ah, so Michaela is now the, the co-host. So she can probably do it now. Try it, Michaela. Yes, now it's working. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me know when you can see it. Thanks so much. Just put it in presentation view and we'll be good to go. Okay. All right, thank you. So um, welcome everybody. Welcome to the session, uh, Entrepreneurship Takes Flight at NASA. We have a great session planned for you today that highlights our expansion of NASA's initiatives and commercialization and seeding new startups with technology through our T2X program. My name is Christy Funk and I manage NASA's T2X initiative. I'm joined today with a great lineup of moderators and panelists and together we hope to deliver a cohesive story that illustrates some approaches to how you can engage with NASA and create high tech, high growth businesses with global impact. So through our T2X program, NASA provides information to the public about opportunities to harness innovation to solve problems. We develop collaborative partnerships within inclusive entrepreneurial ecosystems and academia uh, to grow the tech-based economy. We expand our presence across the country and we strive to create attractive opportunities for early stage entre entrepreneurs to launch businesses with NASA Tech. Michaela, could you go back one slide, please? Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. We have three uh, separate yet cohesive panels in today's session. The first is NASA 101, which is designed to provide an overview of NASA opportunities for entrepreneurial engagement and tech transfer and licensing NASA technology. We're gonna follow that with a panel titled Collaborate, Build and Grow, where one of our inclusive entrepreneurship partners and participating entrepreneurs will share about ecosystem development and the integration of NASA technology to grow businesses that matter. And last but not least, our NASA Tech Is Your Business panel features two NASA technology-derived startups who participated in some of our pipeline programs, and the founders will share their experiences as entrepreneurs launching tech-based businesses. So we ask that you put any questions in the chat box, and I'll facilitate Q&A at the end of each individual panel um, as time allows. So now it's my privilege to welcome today's moderators and panelists. Um, Michaela, next slide, please. Again, I am Christy Funk. I manage the T2X program and work alongside my colleagues at NASA headquarters and NASA centers across the country. I've been at NASA since 2008 and my career has spanned across disciplines from aerospace engineering to space tech and now to entrepreneurship and economic impact initiatives. And joining me as a moderator today is Michaela McShane. While completing her master's degree in marketing communications, Michaela worked in the Office of Student Affairs, creating engaging content for university students. And after graduation, she started her career as the marketing coordinator for the Tech Transfer Office at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, merging a love of academia and a budding interest in technology to expand the Tech Transfer University program. She later discovered that she has a latent, latent past passion for inclusive entrepreneurship and focuses her energy on creating opportunities for early stage entrepreneurs. Michaela is behind the scenes today working hard to make sure everything goes smoothly. Um, so uh, we welcome Michaela. Thanks so much. We're going to provide proper introductions for our panelists at the beginning of each panel, but I'd like to briefly welcome them now. For NASA 101, we have uh, Art Maples and Michaela Waldner. Our Collaborate, Build, and Grow panel includes Jeff Johnson, Peter Odegbami, Malaysia Pouncil, and Andrew Gray. And our NASA Tech Is Your Business panel includes Sergi Albino, Ian Dormal, and Britt Corsi. Thanks so much to all of our panelists for supporting the session today. So to kick things off, let's go ahead and get started with our NASA 101 presentation. Our panelists, Art Maples and Michaela Waldner, work at NASA in Partnership Development and Tech Transfer. Art is the NASA Space Technology Mission Director. It's Director of Strategic Partnerships in the Colorado region. He's responsible for expanding those partnerships with academia, industry, government, and entrepreneurial communities with mutual interest in development of breakthrough technology, breakthrough capabilities and, uh, that support NASA's airspace goals and national priorities. He's served as a congressional fellow for US Senator Bill Nelson and in organizational leadership positions at Goddard Space Flight Center and Kennedy Space Center. Welcome, Art. And Michaela Waldner supports the NASA Tech Transfer Program at Marshall Space Place Center as a licensing executive. 
Our portfolio includes science and technology, engineering directorates, and spacecraft and vehicle systems departments. She doesn't know I put this in here, but I looked it up. Uh, she is a recent mechanical engineering grad from Mississippi State University, and she was a member of the women's soccer team there. And it looks like she continues right now to spend time working with the soccer team to analyze data collected from compression sleeves that monitor muscle activity in an effort to enhance athletes' movements and recoveries. Uh, welcome, Michaela. So with that, I'll turn it over to Art to go ahead and get started with our first panel. Thank you, Christy. So if we could go to the next slide. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Art Maples. Uh, my focus is on the Colorado region, and I am actually based here in Denver over on the east side of town. Uh, if we go to the next slide. So I'm going to oh, go ahead with the video then. Sorry about that. It looks like it cut off there. Go ahead and go to the next slide, Art. Yeah, that's OK. That should give folks a, a taste of uh, what NASA has going on here. So uh, real quickly, just to kind of break it down for you guys as context and background for the rest of the session, uh, we break our areas into four separate mission areas, human exploration and operations, science, space technology, and aeronautics research. And we didn't get to the aeronautics part in that video, but it does um, show some of the interesting things we're doing there, such as uh, low boom supersonic flight, green aviation, things like that. So I'm gonna speed through the rest of this so we can get onto the, the real heart of this presentation. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide. So this just gives you a little sense of uh, where NASA is. I think a lot of folks probably familiar with uh, Houston and Florida. We actually have 10 centers spread around the country. Uh, they all have different focus areas. Some are very much focused on the human space flight, some on science, some on aeronautics. Uh, but if you look at this map, you will notice there's nothing near Denver. So you may be asking, why is NASA here? What are we? Uh, um, interested in Colorado. Um, if we go to the next slide, I will try and answer that for you. 
So Colorado is incredibly important to what we do. Um, a, a lot of our work really is done through our partners and in industry, universities, institutes. Colorado is a massive player in this and very important to missions across all four mission directorates that we have. And I just want to point out, this is not just the giants like Lockheed Martin. Uh, last year, there was over 40 million that went to small businesses in Colorado. And the SBIR, STTR program, which is Small Business Innovative Research, that I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, is a great indicator because Colorado comes in second, only behind California in the number of NASA SBIR awards. So, um, and lest you think that uh, some of these small companies are only working on small things, let me correct that for you. So in the video, uh, you might have caught um, image of uh, Moxie, which is producing oxygen on Mars. First time that's ever been done. A small company up in Broomfield called Air Squared that built some of the uh, critical components of that system. Uh, if you look in the middle bottom here, you see advanced space, that microwave size satellite that's going to be launched to the moon uh, in about six months from now. That's built by advanced space, another company up in Broomfield, uh, about 10 years old there. And then down on the bottom right is a really interesting one. Uh, that picture shows the NASA administrator giving a ceremonial check to uh, the team at Lunar Outpost. Lunar Outpost is only about four years old. They're based over in Golden. And I say ceremonial, that checks uh, a milestone payment. Uh, it's only a 10 cent check, but it's incredibly important because what they are gonna do for us is do the first uh, collection and transfer of materials on the moon from a commercial entity. And although the dollars are not great, that's really important to set the legal precedent and the procedures that will be used in the future uh, as mining materials on the moon uh, becomes part of uh, what's going on in the space economy. So you don't have to be a giant company. You don't even have to be a company that's been around for a long time uh, to be involved in some of our missions. So next slide. So these are some of the ways that uh, small businesses, entrepreneurs, others can get involved uh, with our programs. Um, I'm gonna jump into this so we go to the next slide. So SBIR program, which I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, this is one of the biggest programs that small innovative companies take part in. Uh, if you haven't heard of SBIR, it's really something you need to look into. Uh, large federal agencies with large R&D uh, budgets have SBIR programs. Um, they're all generally structured the same, but implemented in different ways. The way we run our program um, is we have one call, one solicitation per year, generally uh, in the winter, December timeframe, if we can, uh, where we put out the topics that we are looking for proposals on. We may have 20 or more topic areas. This could be anything from artificial intelligence, advanced materials, um, sensor development, things like that. Uh, small businesses can propose. Uh, if they get selected for a phase one, it's a uh, six month uh, effort, $125,000. There are also uh, opportunity to participate in our i program, which I'll come back to in a minute. After phase one, uh, successful companies, there's an opportunity to do a phase two, which is really kind of a prototype development effort. That's a two-year program, $750,000. After that, uh, if continued development is needed, there's some other opportunities, what we call post phase two. Most of those require matching funding. And then phase three is essentially where uh, we or other agencies are, are buying that product, that service from you. One of the cool things about SBIR is if you get through that initial part, um, you have met the competition requirement and agencies can directly contract to you for what it is you're offering. Um, and it doesn't have to be NASA. You may develop something under a NASA SBIR that the Air Force is interested in and they can come directly to you. So going back to the i -Corps, 
Um, this is a neat program that we, sorry, this is a neat program that we offer that is essentially a structured entrepreneurial training program for uh, companies that are taking part in phase one. Uh, I'll go through things, lean startup, customer discovery, things like that. It's no cost to the company uh, and it's a great resource. And if you're wondering why we do that, as great as it is to have an SBIR company uh, produce something that we need, we really want those companies to be commercially successful. It's much better for us if we are just one customer out of many um, and the company is not relying solely on us. So we like to see these SBIR companies successfully commercialize uh, the work they're doing. I'll just mention STTR uh, real briefly. It's similar to SBIR uh, with different phases. However, in STTR, you are partnering with a research institution. And I'll tell you, there are some great ones here in Colorado, Colorado School of Mines, CU Boulder, uh, CSU, great partners. Um, STTR is a smaller program, uh, be less topic areas. Um, however, it actually has uh, a little bit higher win rate. It's not quite as competitive. Um, this is a competitive program. Uh, last year, I think uh, in Colorado on phase ones, there were, I believe about 160 uh, proposals that came out of Colorado and I think uh, 34 uh, got selected, might be 24, I'd have to check on that. But uh, point being is that uh, it is competitive, um, but don't get discouraged if you do apply uh, and you don't get selected the first time around. A lot of companies learn from that experience, go on and get selected um, in later rounds. Okay, next slide. So Entrepreneur's Challenge, this is another neat program we have. It's only a couple of years old. It's run by our science mission directorate. It's somewhat of a, almost like a pre-SBIR program. It only has a couple topic areas. The current ones you see are uh, small satellite, metamaterials, and biomarker detection. We run it in partnership with Starburst Accelerator. Um, and the application process is different. It's a short uh, white paper. Um, up to 20 companies can be awarded 10K and then advance to a second round. And the second round has a pitch event with potential for up to an 80K from NASA uh, for those companies that are selected. One of the neat things for us is that this is a way to reach folks that normally might not participate in some of our other programs, um, entrepreneurs, innovators, folks who are working on stuff, but who haven't really thought about uh, government contracts and may not want to go through the more um, bureaucratic, shall we say, process of, of SBIR. Uh, the other thing about this, this is neat, that is neat, is the topic areas are not as prescriptive. So in SBIR, we are generally saying, here's our problem, here's what we need a solution to. And the entrepreneur's challenge, it's more open. Tell us what really good things you're doing in this area, and we'll see if it matches uh, something that uh, we can use. Next slide. So open innovation prizes, challenges, um, not something you'll probably build your business off, but this is a great way to get involved. Um, if you are successful, a lot of these do have uh, monetary um, awards and great way to uh, build a business uh, at the beginning, make connections, get good press. Um, one, down on the uh, lower left, you'll see a picture there. Uh, that was a recent one we did called the Lunar Lou, which is actually looking uh, for new technologies for toilets that would work uh, in the uh, gravity on the moon. Um, we like this again because this is another way to reach kind of the non-traditional folks uh, who may have great ideas that wouldn't normally interact with NASA. Uh, and this can be everybody from literally garage inventors. Uh, we've had successfully participate in this program to student teams. We run this program through partners, uh, folks like Top Coder, Hero X, things like that. Um, so definitely something worth checking out. Next slide. So last thing I'll mention is uh, partnerships. This is not a uh, funding opportunity for a company, but it is a way to work with them. And um, this is where uh, you can sign an agreement with folks at a particular NASA center to 
access data, facilities, things like this. Again, it will not provide you with funding. Uh, and in some cases, uh, you may need to actually fund if you are trying to access a um, very particular facility we have, capability, things like that. We have reimbursable uh, partnerships where companies can come in and access specialized expertise and facilities at NASA. These are run center by center. Uh, it's not as centrally organized as some of these other programs, um, but it's something that's definitely worth looking into if, if you need a very specialized sort of capability. And next slide. So that's all I was going to talk about. And uh, we'll, I will now pass it off to Michaela to talk about what we're really here for today, which is technology transfer. And then when she's done, if there's time, we will deal with some questions. So thank you very much. Perfect. Thanks, Art. Um, Michaela, I think my slides are a little delayed. So if I get off, um, let me know. <laughs> um, so what can NASA do for me? Well, by putting NASA technology to do to use in your business, you can start a new venture or pivot your company into a new market. NASA has three primary programs that can be utilized by startups and small businesses. Technology Transfer Expansion, or T2X, Technology Transfer, or Small Business Innovation Research, or SBIR. Each of these programs focus on different aspects of innovation and commercialization at different stages of the entrepreneurial cycle. Christy touched on T2X earlier at the presentation, so I won't go into that. Um, and Art had just spoken on the SBRR. So uh, the Technology Transfer Office slogan is bringing NASA technology down to earth. We have patented technologies available for licensing to help start your business or to help it grow. NASA's Technology Transfer Program works to transfer NASA developed technologies to private industries, entrepreneurs, universities, and other organizations who are interested in commercializing our technologies. Next slide, please. Now, what does NASA want from me? We want you to license our technologies. It's good for you and it's good for us. We're happy to help companies launch a startup or improve their existing company's capabilities. The, <clears throat> excuse me, the objective to the technology transfer program is to ensure that the innovations developed for aeronautics and space exploration are made broadly available to the public. By doing so, NASA is giving back to the American taxpayers and helping boost the U.S. economy and maximize the return on the nation's investment in NASA. Next slide, please. NASA Tech is your business. Now, how do you know what NASA technologies are available to license? You can check out our website at technology.nasa.gov and search our patent portfolio and software catalog. While our technologies were developed for space use, many have commercial potential. We have hundreds of commercially available technologies, and you can even search by specific categories, such as communications, environmental, sensors, and robotics, to name a few. Our software catalog has hundreds of programs that can be downloaded at no cost. Licensing and asset technology can provide the foundation for new startup companies. Next slide, please. Now, licensing a NASA technology is a fairly simple process. Like I said, you'd go to the technology.nasa.gov, and once you've come through our patent portfolio and you find the technology you're interested in licensing in, click on it. Now, you'll see at the upper right-hand corner, there's a block that says apply to license. Click on that. You'll apply, you'll, after you applied for the technology, a licensing executive at the representative center, like myself, would get involved in the process and would begin to negotiate terms. When we, once we've reached an agreement to the terms, you'd sign the license agreement and technology is yours. After that, you can begin to work on commercializing a new product or solution. Next slide, please. Now, NASA, NASA offers three kinds of licenses. One, standard commercial license, two, evaluation license, and three, startup license. Our standard license is available in exclusive, partially exclusive, and non-exclusive. They're good for the life of the patent or 20 years of software. There is an upfront fee, but those are negotiated on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, an evaluation license has an upfront fee of $2,500 and lasts for one year. This allows companies to evaluate the technology before committing to a commercial license. NASA is our startup license. This is specifically built for companies that are less than 24 months old, and there's no upfront fee, and it is a non-exclusive license. I'll dig more into the startup license on the next slide. Next slide, please. NASA offers a special program designed to help early stage startups leverage NASA technology. So what's a startup? Startup license. <clears throat> it's specifically designed for companies less than 24 months old. NASA waives the initial licensing fee and there are no minimum fees for the first three years. 
Once the three years ends, if the company wants exclusivity to, to the technology, they have the option to convert the license into a commercial, commercially exclusive or partially exclusive license. If the company is not interested in exclusivity, the non-exclusive license will remain in place for the life of the patent. Next slide, please. Now, for the past 50 years, NASA has been collaborating with commercial companies to help bring space technology down to Earth. If you scan the QR code at the bottom left hand of the slide, it will redirect you to NASA home and city. And have you ever wondered how space exploration and research has impacted your daily life? Well, you can explore the virtual city and home and tour through buildings and rooms to discover what common items were inspired by NASA and helped NASA helped improve. Did you know memory foam was invented by NASA research project to increase the comfort and safety of commercial airline vehicle seats? That's just one example of a NASA technology spinoff. I invite you to explore what technologies are in your house that were developed by NASA researchers. Next slide, please. And at this point, I will turn it back over to Christy. Thank you. Thank you, Art and Michaela. We're gonna um, keep moving forward um, to over to our next group. Um, as Michaela indicated, while most NASA technologies are developed for space-related applications, there are many uses for those technologies to help strengthen local economies to create products and processes of the future and to launch technology-based businesses that solve global challenges. So in an effort to expand the use of NASA's innovations and to augment traditional tech transfer processes, we began to work toward understanding entrepreneurial ecosystems and entrepreneurs themselves. So we started engaging within local communities and worked toward identifying key partnerships and activities that could lead to inclusive innovation and tech-based economic development. So throughout this process emerged a key collaborative activity with Jeff Johnson at the Tech Center Research Park in Newport News, Virginia. And over time, the development of this collaborative partnership has advanced from initial preliminary discussions around problems and needs to development of NASA entrepreneurial training programs and ultimately to the creation and launch of a unique inclusive accelerator that pairs aspiring entrepreneurs with NASA technology to solve real problems. So it's my privilege to introduce our Collaborate, Build, and Grow panelists. Jeff Johnson is the Executive Director of Tech Center Research Park. He began spearheading the, the Tech Center project in 2014 and currently leads the research development and innovation portion of the $450 million mixed-use campus. He identifies, vets, recruits, and supports technology-based companies that are focused on commercializing discovery. A strong record and executive leadership uh, due to his more than 20 years of corporate experience. Jeff is a certified Six Sigma champion trainer, holds an executive MBA and a BA in chemistry from Virginia Tech. Welcome, Jeff. Peter Odegbami <laughs> is an innovator dedicated to achieving his goal of sustainable wealth redistribution in underserved communities through strategic infrastructure implementation and economic development. His background in economics, coupled with his MBA and interest in sustainable technological advancement, provides him with the perfect foundation to achieve this end. His sights are currently set on developing renewable energy resources to invigorate growth, education, and innovation in underserved communities across the globe. Welcome, Peter. Malaysia Pouncil. Malaysia is a recent grad from Texas A&M University Commerce with a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering. During her college career, she was part of the McNair Scholar Program and president of the Institute of Industrial and Systems Engineers. She started her entrepreneurship journey, journey in college with her own brand, where she was soon introdu introduced to a rising entrepreneur organization on campus called Venture College. So with the power of the word yes and the support of her family, she has continued to strive, meet phenomenal people, and come across lifetime opportunities. Welcome, Malaysia. And last but not least, to round out our panel is Andrew Gray. Andrew is an entrepreneur located in Atlanta, Georgia. He focuses on applied economics to create solutions for problems of today with tomorrow in mind. He attained his economics degree at Hampton University where he developed a love for entrepreneurship and energy. He has an extensive background in politics and finance and plans to leverage this background with his passion for helping others in need to create sustainable change. Welcome, Andrew, and I'll turn this over to Jeff to, to get started. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. And again, thank you for this opportunity for us to share our story with uh, great entrepreneurs and the team in Denver and at Denver Startup Week. We appreciate the opportunity to share with you um, our work with NASA. We've been particularly um, 
um, blessed with the opportunity to work with NASA on really moving um, innovation from uh, un unvetted and uh, unsubstantiated kind of uh, ideas with moving them toward um, validated business models and moving it further through the continuum from idea to impact. So I'm gonna share with you kind of the overall structure associated with what we're doing. And then you're gonna hear from the team that's actually doing it and moving the technology and working with NASA. And we encourage you also to do the same in Denver. We are not recruiting. So, um, you know, just, just know that. We are really focused on growing, uh, growing entrepreneurship and commercializing discovery and growing businesses that matter. So Michaela is going to drive for me. And so we're going to try to do this together as a team. So Michaela, next slide, please. I'm going to show this video. And, and this, we start, everything that we do as part of this program starts with a problem. So it's only 90 seconds, but it gives you a view. I'll talk through it. It kind of gives you some snapshots of it's simple and complex what we do something for everyone. It's a special it's place. a destination for it's special many. in so many ways and a home for so many more. It's where we earn our living and where we choose to spend our time. It's who and what we are. We are a collection of communities that provides our residents an immensely diverse and uniquely comfortable place to live, learn, work, and play. We are a steady economic engine that provides almost a million people with quality jobs and career opportunities. We are a region of strategic military and national defense significance to our country. We are Virginia's international gateway that provides a two-way flow of trade and commerce throughout Virginia, the entire mid-Atlantic mega region, and the United States heartland. We are an academic and training portal through which students and workers gain and sharpen the skills they need to compete in an increasingly challenging and ever-changing world. We are. We are. We are. Hampton Roads. We are Hampton Roads. We are Hampton Roads. We are Hampton Roads. We are Hampton Roads. Thank you, Michaela. You can hit the next go button. So, can you hit it again. Yeah, you can just keep advancing it. So, the idea was to level set where we are and how we got connected with NASA. Uh, our focus has been on problems. What you saw in that video really were three things. We have strong assets in the ports. We have strong, thank you, that's perfect. We have strong assets in the ports. We have strong assets in history. Of course, this is where the country was founded, where Jamestown, William. Berg. Those of you who are in the middle part of the country would know where we are. We're located on the East Coast. Um, and then the third one was military and um, federal. So we are strategically located on the eastern side of Virginia. When I, I blew this map out so you can kind of level set. And I'll show you how this works. So if you now hit the, hit the uh, uh, forward, you're going to see that we're strategically located. Next slide. Hit, hit the next slide. Thank you. It should build. Okay, we're strategically located with next to NASA Langley. Our problem is while this we have a pillar uh, based on these three entities, NASA Langley, we have assets that are actually here that we have under leveraged. And one of the things we wanted to do, next slide please, is to grow our innovation economy. So to do so, we located right in between NASA Langley and the Jefferson National Lab, one of 17 DOE facilities that's working on um, electron ion colliders. So we're in the middle of a tremendous amount of assets. Our focus then around solving our problem, which we talked about earlier, was around building in a place where a technology advancement hub, where we can actually help um, advanced innovation to commercialization and the programming, et cetera, that, that follows it. Next slide, next slide. 
Okay. So as a research park, one of the things we want to do in working with NASA is to build, thank you, is to build this partnership so that we can grow and create tech-based startups. So there were three things. When we started the Science and Technology Accelerator Network Program, one of the things we wanted to make sure is we always started with a problem. A problem by itself is just a recognition that something's changed. Next thing we needed was the passion around the problem. That passion had to ignite and turn into some sort of purpose where you were going to ignite it to do something. And finally, there's a place where innovation overlaps our problem, our passion, and our purpose. And that's what we saw. You can go ahead and advance. Um, when you do that, what you start to build, next slide, is a place where you've now started to match your problem with the technologies and the sources that can help you solve, create solutions. What you see here is, you know, you see we have established industries um, that we call blue industries and emerging industries. But what we've done with those problems is matched them with NASA technologies through the program called the Science and Technology Accelerator Network Program. So next slide. So what we do is simply one, NASA comes, NASA comes in and we understand problems and challenges. Art started to talk about that earlier. You can go forward and build. The next thing we wanted to do was um, to bring on universities and those are graduates from students that can do a couple things, help drive the research, both applied and translation, as well as the student pipeline. And really we were going after underrepresented entrepreneurs. We know that entrepreneurs of color and women are traditionally underrepresented in high growth, high tech built to sell companies. And we wanted to go after that directly. The second part of it had to do with matching them with industry and following that up with the resources um, necessary to help move them forward. Next slide. Basically, we're moving, building research around it and moving from a, a concept, moving it toward actually a product and what you see on that continuum. And so what I wanted to do now was let you hear from one of the teams who are taking one of the technologies and moving it forward around this kind of concept. So I'm gonna kick it over now. And I think lead off batter is, raise your hand. Lead off batter is Andrew. So I'm gonna kick it over to Andrew and the team. Peter went away. Go ahead, Andrew. I think it's next is yours. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Jeff. I uh, appreciate that. Um, so as you can see, um, and uh, from these from these visuals that Jeff uh, has really thought this out, um, this innovative, this uh, accelerator program is very comprehensive. And um, he brought us uh, together and uh, I've met Malaysia and Peter there um, where we kind of bonded over our shared passion. I know Jeff talked about the passion. Um, and so uh, I know that I had a passion specifically being raised in Atlanta. Um, like Christy mentioned, I'm from Atlanta. I got my degree at Hampton University. Um, being raised there, uh, homelessness is uh, something that's been a prevalent problem uh, as the city grows and expands, as more people move there, as our rent gets higher, a byproduct of you know higher rent is um, an increase in homelessness rates. So um, homelessness uh, and pollution attached to that. Um, so those are two things that have really been um, something that's been on my radar um, to create a solution for. Um, so that's a problem that I saw in a, a city that I loved um, that I cared much about. And so uh, it was just about making a solution or trying to find a solution uh, that would fix that today, um, uh, you know, for future generations as well. And it would be a sustainable change that we could implement into our, into our city. Um, and when I met Peter in Malaysia, you know, we clicked over um, kind of the passions that we had um, and uh, how that would, you know, uh, lead us into our purpose and what we were supposed to do and what we should do. Um, so that kind of brought me to them and uh, I'm glad I got a chance to uh, collaborate with them on this, this project with this technology. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Malish Pansel, a recent grad from a and Commerce. So I grew up around STEM before I truly knew what it was. But as I went through high school, I noticed there were only a few girls in my school, or sometimes I was the only one. Um, then I went to college, and that's where I really seen it. At first, I thought it was cool to be the 
one of the few girls in the class, but then I started to wonder why. Um, I want to inspire and encourage other women and girls that are looking into the field of STEM, that if I can do it, you can do it. There's just so much we can conquer once we put our mind to it. Peter and Andrew are two wonderful people I've met through this accelerated program. And from here, I became inspired to want to help, to want to be a helping can in leading the African-American culture group and promoting tech and support needed to encourage us not to only be involved in STEM and innovation fields, but show we can be revolutionary in this environment and with it provide education and a platform for others to follow in our footsteps and include others that are further ahead. Good evening, everybody. My name is Peter Odigbami. I'm from the UK. I got my undergraduate degree in economics at Hampton University, which is where Andrew and I first met and clicked. And then I got my MBA immediately after. And thankfully, throughout this program, I've met Malaysia. And as Andrew said, we really clicked together when we stumbled upon uh, this problem and this potential solution so it's really exciting to eventually be here and to be a part of this process you know solar tech and sustainable technology itself is a growing field and being able to at least be at this point in the process is really exciting moving forward and I, I, i'm really excited for what we're about to present today so next slide please yeah, so like Peter said, um, solar, it's a growing, it's growing at a, you know, an amazing and alarming rate. Um, and with good reason, um, you know, fossil fuels, traditional fossil fuels, I'd say are, you know, kind of reaching their end of a, their end of life cycle, you know, um, we're going, going into a world where a lot of economies, a lot of local economies, state uh, governments, um, car makers are all trying to go carbon neutral, carbon free, um, by, you know, 2045, 2050 at the latest. Um, so, there's been a really hard push, um, you know, when it comes to uh, administration wise as well, there's been a really hard push to really get uh, renewable energy out there. And so um, we saw a hole or um, a place in a market, uh, an emerging market um, that we could put a solution through. So um, one of the one of the reasons why renewables is gaining so much, um, you know, momentum is because of uh, the environment, the effects we have, the effects we, we leave on the environment are really important um, as a people. And we care about the environment. We also care about people in that environment. Um, and so land is getting scarce as time goes on. Uh, it's one of our most valuable assets. And so with the technology like that, we like we have with the NASA high efficiency solar cell that uses selenium rather than silicone in the intra layer, um, we use this technology uh, to improve on light captures. So this, this technology has a light capture of upwards of 40 to 50% in um, solar industries, uh, the average is around 20 uh, to 25 at the high, you know, the high range, the high range of the light capture. So this type of product allows us to capture more light while using less space. Um, and we know, like I said, space is scarce. So that's something that we wanna capitalize on. Um, and the population is growing. And so the population is growing so rapidly that uh, there's an increased uh, demand for energy. Um, and with that clean energy, uh, we should demand clean energy rather than something that would harm the environment more or leave it in a um, worse than what we inherited. As. So uh, we wanted to compensate for that increased energy with uh, renewables, um, clean energy, um, something that can really meet and sustain um, the more higher demands in infrastructure. And so um, a byproduct of all this also, um, and what, our, what really drives us is our passion is uh, helping underserved communities. And so this is a product that will not only affect, you know, commercial um, utility scale uh, solar, uh, residential solar, it'll also help underserved communities and people who um, cannot help themselves. Uh, that's what we like to say. We love, we love to help people who cannot help themselves. And so this is a technology that allows us to do that. Um, and uh, there's actually a project going on in Virginia that Peter will actually talk about now uh, with the University of Richmond. So at the University of Richmond, we're using that as a model, as a model to kind of follow in, follow in their footsteps. Where right? they've uh, partnered with an organization to supplement almost all, if not all, of their energy usage with solar tech. And we thought that business model was very interesting. And with our potential market, we think it could be very applicable and hit all of our passions. Um, we want to partner with potential HBCUs that tend to be surrounded by more underserved communities and build similar, similar structures, micro structures to facilitate their energy needs. And we think this bridges all of our passions and solves a lot of the solutions that we see out there. You know, 
uh, minorities in tech, we can bring the tech to the minorities, partner with these institutions, engage with them and bring them into this next, this next stage of you know, life going into sustainability. And at the same time, we can go into local communities, serve them in, in terms of providing them with sustainable technology, sustainable energy, and uh, facilitating the underserved. I mean, it's it's our, where we're seeing ourselves going. We're not we're not hanging our heads by it and saying this is exactly the way it's going to pan out. But we're really hopeful in in the way we're going, and we really want to be successful as we go through with this. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> I believe it's safe to say we have all had a wonderful experience throughout this accelerator. To this day, we continue to grow, learn, and prosper with one another. We started out with an idea of what we thought it took to run a business. Then we were introduced to a structure, starting with a business canvas model. From there, each team developed a set of hypotheses. But in order to turn our unvalidated hypothesis into validated hypotheses, we are currently implementing customer discovery, where we have learned to ask open-ended questions and listen to our customers. Throughout this accelerated program, I've learned so much from others and have been pushed out of my comfort zone. It's been an amazing journey to be surrounded by open-minded individuals, and I'm grateful to be part of the team. Yeah, um, speaking on the experience, um, like Malaysia said, it was a great, uh, great experience up in Virginia at the Tech Center uh, under the tutelage of Jeff. You know, um, somebody he was he was kind of hard on us, but he he uh, let us also enjoy ourselves and really. Um, you know, be around, enjoy being around like-minded people. As you can tell by the pictures, uh, we clearly enjoyed ourselves, but it was a very comprehensive environment uh, where we got to um, get the tools to, uh, to build a successful business. Um, you know, in a world where it's survival of the fittest, um, it's important to know that we uh, have the tools to succeed. Um, and that's exactly what we, what we received when we were there, um, our short time there with the continued support of the tech center of NASA, um, it's been great. You know, uh, like uh, Malaysia said, we're still in the early developmental stages of the company. Um, so we're still doing the customer discovery. You know, we're still doing uh, uh, problem solution fit, making sure that we have a product that really uh, people will want, people will use. Um, then we can move forward, you know, later on into the product market fit, um, things like that. I'm sure we've all heard of it as they were at the startup week. So um, we're just really loving this process. Um, we're enjoying every step of the way and um, we're making sure that we do something um, that we can really be proud of um, that really makes an impact not only on people but on the environment um, and so this is a great great experience and we uh, we love it yeah at this point I'm just parroting these two you know they said a lot and they spoke about their experiences and for me it was it was so much fun being able to engage not just with like-minded individuals as Andrew said but just being in that space, you know, going through this process on your own is very challenging. And thankfully for me, I have these two fantastic individuals here to be on my team. But, you know, we all go through struggles. Even doing it as a team, you have to struggle. But thankfully, we're a part of a cohort where numerous different people are doing it. So we have stresses, we have issues, we call one of them up, they help us push through those stresses because they're going through it at the same time. And I feel like that's one of the most impactful things about what Jeff has developed here that we can really come together and develop this. And it's it's been such a great experience while we've been here. And you know, Jeff is always letting us know exactly what we're trying to get out of this. And it's it's so packed impactful. It just stays in my mind, creating successful, sustainable, high-tech, high growth built to scale companies. I mean, every time I say it, I just get a little bit excited about what we're trying to do here. And you know, every every day, yeah, lack of sleep aside, it's so fantastic being a part of this. And uh, yeah. We, Jeff's always talking about, ultimately we wanna make a difference in our communities and you know everything he says and everything that he's been pushing, NASA alongside him and all of the partners and everything that they've done have really pushed us to mature as people and mature as entrepreneurs and we're really excited for what's to come next. Like other teams here, we have other teams looking into industry 4.0 development, into carbon nanotech development, into biometrics, like there's so many different smart engaging people doing so many great things and honestly i just want to say thank you and thank you to all we all here at denver you know taking the time to listen to us you know even in these early stages and uh, yeah thank you all. 
Okay, Christy, we'll hand it back to you so we can move further down that continuum and hear from some of the other great groups that have gone further to the right. Thanks again for giving us an yeah, opportunity to share our story. Yeah, that's great. Uh, thank you all. We wanted to start this off sharing about, you know, what we have here at NASA with our portfolio, but we really wanted to dive into um, what it looks like pre-company formation with the entrepreneurs that are engaging in programs such as the Tech Center Accelerator Network Program, and then um, move toward learning and listening to some who have done it, some who, who have taken that technology and launched businesses around it. Um, I will say to the panel that just spoke, um, thank you all so much. It's really been my privilege to know you all in the entire cohort uh, during this program. And we really look forward to where you're gonna go with all this great work. Um, we also look forward to engaging with other aspiring entrepreneurs to see how our technologies can contribute to global change. So thank you all so much. We'll now transition to our final panel where NASA technology derived company founders are going to discuss their journeys, their challenges, successes uh, with starting their businesses and, and what they do. Um, Serge and Ian were involved in our Tech Transfer University program before launching Ecospheres and Brent was a cohort member in the FedTech program before launching Earth XYZ. Each of these founders brings drive and energy to entrepreneurship and we look forward to hearing their stories. So please let me formally introduce our final panelists for today. Um, let's see, uh, surgery. It's just myself, uh, Ian. I see Ian, uh, Serge, is Serge on as well today? S Serge is not on, it'll, it'll just okay. be myself. Okay, sounds good. So uh, Ian is a co-founder and the executive vice president for Ecospheres with 15 plus years of experience in organizational leadership, startups, and strategic sales and marketing. He currently oversees business development initiatives for Ecospheres, including community outreach, client procurement, um, and public relations, corporate strategy, and partnerships. Ian has been named Orlando Business Journal's 40 Under 40 twice and OBJ CEOs of the year for his proven business leadership in founding six separate startup companies. Ian has also earned an MBA in marketing and operations. So welcome, Ian. Thank you. Um, and uh, following a uh, talk from Ecospheres and Ian, we'll hear from Earth XYZ. Earth XYZ's founder, Britt Corsi, is fueled by her passion for technology and its ability to help shape solutions and is especially dedicated to developing Earth XYZ. So leading up to Earth XYZ, Brett set up and served as CEO for an AI marketing startup and was sought out to provide expertise for a startup that has since raised more than 17 million in capital. She developed an international engineering consultancy from conceptual stages through acquisition by a global technology supplier with revenues exceeding 500 million. Brett serves as a startup mentor for New Chip Accelerator, and she is active with the district captain team for the American Society of Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Welcome, Brett. So, Urge, I'm, I'm, Ian, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to you to kick off uh, this panel. Thank you so much. Um, just to give you guys a background. Um, let's see. Here. Am I uh, driving from my end, Chrissy, or do you guys have? Uh, no, Michaela McShane's going to drive. Go ahead and next next slide, uh, Michaela. We'll start up Ecospheres. So, there you go. Yeah, thank you. To give you guys a background, um, so our Ecospheres really came out of the NASA Kennedy Space Center. It was really the Spears technology that was being uh, really explored uh, by an MBA team from Rollins College in Orlando, Florida. So it was through that NASA Tech Transfer Program that this technology was being vetted and really trying to understand, um, you know, the, the problem that existed in the marketplace and seeing if there was a fit. Um, I myself, I have about uh, 18 years experience of entrepreneurship venture. So I really appreciate every, every founder and entrepreneur here that spoke before. It, it definitely takes a, it takes a team and also a village to really get a, you know, technology off the ground and, and to, to put the resources behind it. So really appreciate the journey that you guys are on and anyone else who wants to be an entrepreneur. It's definitely not for the, <laughs> for the weak of heart. Uh, there will be a lot of late nights, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, blood, sweat, and tears crying on your co-founder's uh, shoulder. 
And I do recommend that you do find a co-founder. You cannot go this journey alone. <laughs> so having said that, I'll, I'll go to the next slide here. <laughs> so what does Ecospheres do? Um, so we were able to take uh, this technology. It didn't look like this way back when, but it's the Spears technology and bring it out from the NASA corridors and really find a way to commercialize it and build a clean technology system that can extract and destroy contaminants in soil, sediment, and water. And what's unique about us is we do so in non-thermal, non-combustion processes, and, and this was developed by NASA. Since then, we've developed other technologies, but our namesake technology, as I mentioned, is Spears. And we've been at it four years now, and we, we raised the seed round of of $2.2 million. And since then, we've done $1.3 million of safe notes amongst the, the craziness of, of COVID and the pandemic. We, we thought it wise not to raise our Series A quite then. Now we are doing a Series A. We're very fortunate to have two term sheets in front of us. So I would say we relatively, we've done this pretty quickly uh, in the last four years, especially for a hard tech company. Um, but it's really come down, how we would have been so successful, I would say, is our mentorship and finding that lead investor in the seed round that really believed in us. So we work with Kiranaga Partners, an early stage venture capital firm that really is trying to back founders who are trying to solve big problems in, in humanity. So I would say finding that, uh, that early mentor that either gives you that angel funding or your seed round is very crucial to, to the starting of your venture. Next slide, please. So, Quick backstory of, of why, why did NASA create this technology, right? And a lot of people don't realize that NASA is, it has a ton more innovation than just space innovation. So NASA Kennedy Space Center has a lot of sensitive wetland areas, a lot of uh, areas uh, where they are protecting nature and conservation. And there are places of there that have contamination, um, especially due to the rockets that sent up to space. There's a lot of byproducts that created from, from the blast off. And those got into our, our soil and to the soil around there, also to the waterways. So they wanted to figure out a way to remove these contaminants without uh, destroying the habitat. So that's where Spears was invented by Dr. Jackie Quinn there, as well as Dr. Phil Maloney, also our chief advisor for Ecospheres. And it's really a, a sediment uh, layer uh, protection uh, technology that gets pushed into the sediment layer and can absorb those toxins like a sponge. So in 2017, after the Rollins College students, you know, did their due diligence and said, hey, I think there's a really big problem that can be solved with this technology. Uh, my uh, co-founder, Serge Albino, who also worked with the co-founders there at NASA, who was also a former NASA aerospace engineer, uh, we partnered up together and we negotiated for the ex exclusive license for NASA. Um, not very few people uh, get an exclusive license, but we were able to do it. And I would always like to say, too, that you don't need the uh, exclusive license uh, but we use that as, as a great way to, to leverage uh, our, a way to get the, our seed round closed. So that's how the beginning of our, tech, uh, our startup uh, took place. Next slide. So what major problem are we solving? And you know, I, I really appreciate previous entrepreneurs saying, well, you got to understand the problem and, and find a solution to fit it. Because sometimes certain problems may not be large enough to be to get uh, you know venture capital and that's okay right you can you can build all the great businesses without venture capital, but for us we realized that we needed to raise venture capital. So the problem we're solving is 94% of America's waterways uh, per EPA study are contaminated with these industrial contamination um, that are, are are known to be carcinogens. So once it gets into the sediment later into our waterways, it'll virtually stay there for a very long time. So these contaminants, these man-made chemicals were used across industries and they still exist today, even 80 years later. Unfortunately, the problem is only getting worse. Uh, there's additional contamination due to furthering of, of technology innovation as well as you know, industrialization across the world. So we really see this fit for a green and sustainable technology company to find better ways, more cost-effective ways to solve this problem. Next slide, please. It's not just a US problem, it's a worldwide problem. So as a three-year-old startup, we're now working with United Nations and organizations that can really bring these problems to light. So now we're under development of using our technology to create a, a system, pivot our system to destroy the PCBs and other contaminants in oil stockpiles as well. Next slide. 
and of course, if you just you create a startup, you have to understand, you know, what are you going to, to be a substitute for? Um, and for us, it's, it's really about eliminating incineration and transport to a landfill or an incinerator. So of course, those are very uh, negative. There's negative effects to that. It's cost prohibitive, environmentally destructive. So we are, are trying to bring a green, sustainable way to solve these legacy contamination issues. Next slide. We always like to highlight this. If you're familiar with the Hudson River cleanup, uh, GE dredged 4.5 million tons of contaminated sediment, and then they used about 600,000 vehicles to transport that sediment to a, a new, newly built facility in New Mexico that costs several hundred millions of dollars. And that's currently being still there. It's housed today. Um, not only did the project create an excessive amount of GHG emissions, but it also costs GE north of $2 billion. So that's the ineffective ways of what how the problem is being dealt with today. So whenever starting a startup, you have to identify places where uh, industries that are just you know ripe to to tackle to disrupt with new innovation. So for environmental, uh, that's exactly where we saw this, our technologies being able to fit and create a new industry and disrupt the old ways of thinking. Next slide. really high level what we're able to do with with NASA technology and other technology we developed is that same 20,000 trucks of contaminated soil or sediment we can extract just the toxins from it and then once we've concentrated in a few barrels we eliminate that altogether completely so we're able to save all that natural resources um, and do this on site so we're able to also get uh, significant cost savings for the client since we're not transporting uh, tons and tons of contaminated sediment or soil next slide So for us, it's, it's really extraction and then elimination process. If you can figure out the way to extract using these NASA-based technologies, we found a way to eliminate. And how do we eliminate it is using proprietary UV technology um, that we uh, really actually license from a sister company called BioDefense in our, our lead investor portfolio. So it's really that comprehensive solution that we're bringing to the marketplace to eliminate this problem once and for all. Next slide. As I mentioned, mobile modular, non-thermal. So there's a really big movement of eliminating GHGs into the atmosphere, uh, really cleaning soil and sediment without the detriment of clean air. And we've been able to find a client savings of up to 50% when it comes to displacing incineration and landfilling while reducing, again, those CO2 emissions. Next slide. So this is the NASA Spears technologies I mentioned. So it's a scalable matte liner of plastic spikes, HDPE spikes that you see with a reagent inside it, and it gets embedded into the sediment layer. Um, so that's actually pictures of our, our Sweden deployment. And once it's embedded into that sediment layer, you leave it, it's a set and forget method and absorbs toxins like a sponge. Uh, why this method is, is really getting positive traction is that it doesn't destroy the aquatic habitats that dredging would, doesn't cause uh, resuspension but it can truly remove just the contaminants from the natural aquatic system without harming the aquatic system. So it's really a set and forget method and absorbs these toxins like a sponge. Next slide. Uh, that's just the deployment process. You fill the, the ecospheres up with the solvent, insert it to a mat, deploy into the sediments and then leave it and it absorbs those toxins and then we then destroy the toxins and reuse the solvent by processing it through our eco cube. Next slide. And some case studies here. This is our, we were really lucky to have early traction. And of course, when you work with NASA or other organizations that have already spent all the money in developing this technology, you already have a leg up. And that's the beauty of going through NASA tech transfer office is you have a great name behind you. <laughs> and sometimes, uh, you know, I, I use that name as much as possible being a, being a marketer. So sometimes uh, they, they have to curb my enthusiasm <laughs> with what I can say and what I can show. Um, but uh, anyway, just keep pushing it until they say no. Um, so Port of San Diego was was one of our, our, our early clients and we love them. Um, they gave us an opportunity with the Blue Incubator Program. Um, and so you can go, the, go to the next slide, please. I probably won't run through all these slides, but I'll just show a couple more. I, I know I'm running out of time. I don't want to take... Uh, Brittany's time, but this uh, another project we were able to, to work with Pepco, 
we're really, really keen on those areas, especially of underserved communities, because that's traditionally, unfortunately, historically, where contamination was dumped uh, and it's still prevalent today. So this is a project we're really proud about, Washington, D.C. area on the Anacostia River, um, and we're going to be deploying a pilot study there in November and really expanding that program, um, as well as looking at other, other major cities. Next slide. Um, I'll, I'll probably end here on this slide, but as you can see, we've been pretty busy across industry sectors. Um, I would say I would mention that it's always important to find, uh, you know, product market fit. Um, and before that, you know, you would really have to find uh, potential pilots to prove your technology. For us, we kind of went wide. We did that uh, sort of not on purpose, but we just had so many opportunities to really plant and find different partners. So, uh, but for us, this problem is big enough that we can sort of do that. And we had the resources to do that. But I, typically I would tell people to, to find a vertical and just go as deep as you can. Um, but make sure you find the right vertical. So uh, I think I'll, let me, let me, actually one more slide. We'll go to the next slide and we'll end there. So this one's a good one. Before we got into this industry, we really had to break down like the flow of revenue. So it's really important to understand how, uh, how everyone makes money in terms of the value chain. And so what we did is we originally saw ourselves on the bottom, as you can see, that's typically the last place technology developer gets revenue. So we had to break the model. And by doing so, we decided to just sort of skip the engineering consulting groups and go to the top. So we talked to the government officials, we talked to all the stakeholders. I think that's really important early on. Someone said it before, you gotta to talk to hundreds of customers and, and stakeholders to really understand the value proposition that you're offering the marketplace. So uh, making those inter interviews and, and talking to early clients are, is crucial in, in your, uh, your journey as an early startup. So I'll, I'll stop there. I know I could talk forever, but if anyone has any questions, feel, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be glad to, 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 to help you along the journey and, and also uh, you know, see, you know, give you some lessons learned as well. So feel free to reach out. Thank you. All right, are we just doing a hard transition here? Yeah, You're sorry, that was, a, that was a quick stop. I don't want to take your time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Christy, um, how many questions do we already have? That way I know how much time to spend and how much to keep for questions. Nope, go right ahead as long as you need. Uh, take about 10 minutes or so, 10, 12 minutes. Oh, wow, okay, that's more than I anticipated, but okay. <laughs> okay. Um, hi guys, uh, Britt Corsi here. Um, I, uh, I'm happy to be here. Obviously, this is really cool. And thanks to NASA. Thanks for Denver Startup Week. And um, feel free to connect, follow me. Um, next slide. <laughs> Thank you, Michaela. Um, so in terms of getting a better understanding of where I'm at, uh, place me right in the middle of Jeff Johnson and his group and uh, Ian at Ecospheres. And that's kind of where I'm at in the journey itself. Um, so in 2020, I finished out my journey with FedTech, which is where we started um, exploring NASA technology. Um, since then, I've joined an accelerator, pitched at Accelerate 2021, have made partners along the way. Um, and now we're getting to the place where we're ready to develop some programs, talk about piloting with communities, um, and potentially um, have some investors come in, which is a, a pretty cool place to be. Um, so far, I have not taken any funding. So everything I've been doing is on my own with minimal resources, um, kind of a very scrappy background in startups to begin with. Uh, so that's given me the ability to, to take this journey. Um, next slide. So we'll talk about the journey of figuring out where to go from the beginning, because I think that's probably the most important part for people who are joining this to understand at least from looking at NASA technology as, as something they're interested in to actually looking at what solutions they could go after. 
So with FedTech, I was introduced to NASA Power out of NASA Langley in Virginia. And the um, climate data from NASA Langley was raw data. So at the time there was no real product. Um, there were a bunch of different solutions that could come from it, but I had to really dive into the market and understand all of the ecosystems, all of the products that exist, what our climate issues were at the time. Um, and it was a really long journey and you've heard it from everybody so far. It's early mornings, late nights, maybe four hours of sleep every day for a very long period of time. Um, but you're really diving in and doing the research and analyzing what makes sense. Um, so I spent a lot of time waking up in the morning, reading articles um, from different industries that I had never paid attention to before, whether it was climate, um, energy, investment portfolios, um, documentaries coming out about the environment, just completely diving in um, so that I can understand every part of the problem that we're facing today. Um, and going back to the technology of how can I use this technology? Where does it fit? What makes sense? How can it, how can it be formed into a solution for all of the problems that we're facing today? Um, and so I got into trying to figure out where the gaps were because I looked at a wide variety of solutions where this data could be used for home management systems with smart energy. It could be used to um, develop wearable clothing technology to charge you know, battery devices around you. There's so many different applications, but I wanted to go after what the real big problem was and, and how can it help to solve it. So the gap that I was seeing in 2020 and, and now what's kind of come to the surface a little bit more is the gaps in between actually rolling out the clean energy agenda itself um, and making sure that the ecosystems are all connected within um, those goals. And so, um, let's see, I don't know if it's next. Can we look at next slide? See what, if I got it on there? Nope, let's go back. <laughs> You don't know. So, so, so the gaps that we were looking at um, start off at the government level, right? Work your way into your residential and commercial side and all of the, the products and services in between. And these are for people like the ones that are in R&D right now with Jeff Johnson's group and, and the ones at NASA and R&D at the Department of Energy and even the products with Ecospheres exist in the ecosystem. And so the problem was that there was no real central location to find all of these solutions for sustainability, clean energy, um, clean tech, and the circular economy. So we went off to try and validate this. Um, and we saw early validation within the product and service companies, later validation within communities, um, especially sustainability focused com uh, communities, and then most recently, we saw some validation um, in some pretty big companies, which is really um, a lot for me to, to kind of look in the mirror and say, wow, last year, this was your assumption, and now it's being completely validated. Um, so I'd say if you're at a point where you don't know if you believe in the solution that you're creating, keep going, because I was at a point where I almost gave up, but to hear such huge companies ha have positive thoughts about this solution and, and know that this is what they've been looking for is insane to me. Um, so Earth XYZ, we wanna go to the next slide, Michaela. I think we're ready for it now. <laughs> um, so Earth XYZ is a digital search engine ecosystem uh, built with a marketplace. And the goal is to accelerate uh, clean energy. Um, we're providing that central location that the gap primarily existed in, where stakeholder collaboration in communities um, and businesses can meet with consumer needs. So we're able to pair up and match those people that are looking for solutions with the people that have the solutions. And that's the biggest gap that we have right now. Um, next slide, Michaela. So going back to the gaps that I was talking about earlier, 
um, focusing primarily on the, the biggest players, right? You're looking at your government, you're looking at their constituents, which is your residents basically, um, and then the businesses. And those are primarily the groups that we're looking at that are having the hardest time rolling out all of the clean energy goals. Um, and that's where, that's where our market serves. Uh, Christy, how much time do we have? Running out of it, but still have a couple minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, next slide, Michaela. Um, so we're able to attack a bunch of different verticals. Basically, as a slide, you can see what they are. Next slide, Michaela. <laughs> um, and the validation that I'm talking about now that I uh, assumed would happen back in 2020 is now we're seeing all of the investments come in. We're seeing the growth happen within those markets in all of the verticals that Earth XYZ serves, which is amazing. Uh, next slide, Michaela. So if you would like to ask me questions or if you would like to help Earth XYZ, be a contributor, whatever it may be, please email me. Um, happy to talk to anybody, would love to engage. Happy to take on more partners if you wanna pilot. Um, next slide, Michaela. Do we put one up? Or did you guys take it off because you don't care? <laughs> <laughs> No, we we actually uh, deleted that last slide. We have everybody's contact info on our on our final slide. But um, okay. Deb, before you close out, can you um, talk about why you didn't quit? When yeah. you wanted to? Maybe. <laughs> um, so I did not quit because it. Uh, oh, you put me on the spot with this, Christy. Like, way to go. So. <laughs> Sure did. <laughs> um, so the environment, nature, and animals has been a very big thing for me um, for the bulk of my life. And what I've been working towards in technology is getting enough experience to be able to create solutions in this space. And without funding, it's really hard to build when you can't afford to pay a developer. And so you got to be really scrappy. Um, and during those times, you get to those weak moments where you don't really have much left <laughs> um, and you don't think that there's a, a road ahead of you. So you contemplate that giving up phase. Um, but what stuck with me was I would regret not pursuing this as far as I could um, on my deathbed more than I would, you know, giving up in that moment and, and looking back and saying, you know, I wish I kept going. Um, so that's kind of, I think, something all in the pit of our entrepreneurial stomachs is you, you regret giving up more than you do failing. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks so much Thank to you. our final, final panel here with Ecospheres and Earth XYZ. Um, that's going to conclude today's session. We're about out of time. So some final uh, recognitions were uh, thank you to Michaela Waldner, Michaela McShane, Art, Ian, Britt, Jeff, Andrew, Peter, and Malaysia. Um, you all really helped to tell the story of bringing NASA technology down to earth. Thanks so much for being a part of it. Um, thank you to Denver Startup Week, uh, to all attendees. And um, feel free to follow up with any of us with uh, questions, comments, et cetera. Uh, contact information is on this final slide and I believe it's all posted um, on YouTube now as well via recording. Uh, stay safe and well, that concludes it for today. So. Thanks, Christy. Thanks, everybody. everybody. Thanks for right joining us. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we just sign off. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, ladies. Thank you for everything. <laughs>